Wake up every morning with just the news. All the news and none of the noise. Good Monday morning. Welcome to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield and glad you're with us. Wow. Big weekend. I'm sure you all were following up, but we're going to get you the latest update on everything. President Trump banned permanently from almost all social media, including Spotify, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. This happened late Friday night. We are going to go straight to a social media alternative platform. You might have heard about it. It's called Clout Hub. And a senior advisor is joining me this morning to talk about what they offer and how it works. Good morning, Tom Borelli. Hey, Carrie. Happy Monday morning. Hey, yes. We're live. We're here. It's Monday. So we saw this big news over the weekend that President Trump was banned by Twitter. Uh, we had people speaking out like Senator Tim Scott. He put out a tweet and he said Twitter's decision to ban the president all while, all while Iran's Ayatollah Khamenei, China's propaganda arm, Venezuelan dictator Nicolas Maduro, and many others use the platform to amplify hate and violence is wrong and further reinforces the urgent need to reform Section 230 exemptions. Platforms should never pick winners and losers. And while this is yet another troubling example of conservative censorship, we must be clear that silencing any legitimate political debate is not the answer as we seek a path forward in a world hungry for objectivity and truth. So you see the senator there saying there's a double standard here that if you're going to crack down on speech, which they says is in violation of democratic norms or violating just you know civil discourse and the like, that they should really be attuned to dictators and remove them from their platform. What's your take on all of this? You're there at Clout Hub. Do you see this as an opportunity for your social media platform? Well, first of all, uh, Carrie, yeah, it certainly is. It is a opportunity for Cloud Hub because we believe we're the next generation of platforms for social media. We respect people's privacy and it really is a free speech zone. And it really combines the elements of a lot of what's out there now. Uh, like Twitter, there's a discussion timeline. Like Facebook, there are groups where people can talk among themselves on a certain topic. Like YouTube, you can uh, have your own video channel, uh, some programs there as well. And also an individual individual can just post videos just like YouTube. So it really is an all-in-one platform. I mean, that's the good news. But the bad news is while this may be good for CloudHub, what's going on in terms of now being an alternative, we really have to uh, not take any joy in the fact that uh, Big tech is taking out Parler, one of our competitors. We think that is a low blow. That is not right. And what we're really seeing is the power of big tech to punish President Trump. They had wanted to do this forever and also punish his followers. At the end of the day, free speech must reign. But Democrats, big tech, Silicon Valley, all their allies, they are afraid of President Trump and his followers sort of out there to silence us. Tom, have you seen a spike in your user base just over the weekend? Oh, I'm sure. I don't have the numbers right now, but getting on Cloud Hub now is a little bit of a challenge because I think there's just a surge of people signing up. I've been able to get in, but not consistently. So if people go to cloudhub.com or download the app, uh, it may take a little while, but I'm, I'm asking you to please be patient. But I do understand that Cloud Hub was the third largest uh, social uh, download for social media. It's number three following uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I think it's number seven overall in downloads. So and that's really, just, we're seeing- That's it, just it, since this past weekend or? Yeah, over the, last few, over the last few days. Yeah, so there's been an explosive growth. But again, this is, uh, our fortunes at uh, Cloud Hub, what's going on now is, is much bigger than that because what we see are the elements of power trying to silence Americans. We hope people do go to Cloud Hub where they'll be able to exercise their free speech, but we take no comfort in what big tech is doing to Parler or any other social media platform alternatives. And have you guys faced any trouble? We've heard that you guys have had some trouble with your servers and your tech providers. Was that all in the past? Are you dealing with that now? Do you have new challenges? 
Well, we had a, uh, an issue with IBM because IBM was the uh, service provider for people who had a video channel. And for some reason, they had a, an, a challenge or they had an issue with one or two of the programs. So they took all the programs on the channels out, including uh, Real America's Voice, because Real America's Voice had a channel there. But uh, the CEO, Jeff Brain, is, is now working on a new way where they can create their own uh, software so that you don't have to be reliant on people like IBM. Because remember, at the end of the day, Big corporations, whether or not even Silicon Valley, they're also working against, you know, President Trump's supporters. So the people really need to group together and an opportunity and a platform like CloudHub provides people an opportunity where they can actually meet, discuss issues. And the real goal of CloudHub is where people can get together and become civic minded and change uh, their local politicians, their local national politicians, discuss issues, discuss whatever you want. There's In the future, there's going to be topics like a, a, a portion of it dedicated just to religion. So these are really important for the American people to have platforms where they can discuss whatever issues they want. We can't be silenced. That's why we have the First Amendment. Tom, First I want to ask you, Tom, I want to ask you, because we put up your, just while you were talking, the play nice, the mantra, the code of ethics, if you will, that CloudHub lives by. You say that you, the two key planks in CloudHub's platform are bringing people together and freedom of speech. Leave your animus at the login page, come to debate with forceful passion, collaborate and reach out with compassion, win and lose gracefully through facts, insightful arguments and discussion. What's your moderation policy? Because this was part of the parlor situation that Apple kicked them off. We'll get more to it after the break, but real quick, 30 seconds. How do you guys approach moderation? Well, uh, actually, we have artificial intelligence that, that filters out some, some of the content that uh, really isn't part of, of normal discourse, I'll put it that way. So you have bots, basically, that do it mechanically. Correct. It, 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 something that is really offensive, based, you know, on racial issues, other issues, the uh, the machine will take won't, won't allow them to post. Very interesting. Tom Borelli, stay with us right after the break. He'll come back with us. He's a senior advisor here with Clout Hub. We're going to talk more about the First Amendment parlor, what this all means for you, our audience. If you're conservative, libertarian, independent, whatever your stripe. This has a lot of implications here for all of us here as we think about freedom of speech here in the U.S. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey there, good morning, and welcome back here to Justin News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield. Glad you're here with us. So before the break, we started to talk about the moderation and the implications that this has on freedom of speech. And when we're talking about moderation, this means the policies that you have for basically controlling or patrolling or just monitoring the speech on your platform. And over the weekend, Parler, which is an alternative to Twitter, has been removed from Apple stores. And it's even blocked on some servers for not moderating their speech. Amazon Web Services also kicked Parler off. The CEO of Parler, John Matt, says that he would not bend to Apple's demands for increased surveillance and moderation of content and was exploring, quote, many options. Matsy also said that the decision by Amazon could result in a week-long interruption of service. And you can see we're putting it up here on screen. If you try to go to parlor.com, it is this site cannot be reached. You've got the error domain there. I tried opening it this morning and got the same thing. You can open the app, but then it's the pinwheel of doom. It just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. Now up uh, the Response from Capitol Hill, Devin Nunes has said that there should be a racketing investigation about the big tech targeting of Parler. The question about whether there will be uh, implications here or regulation. The big debate here is about whether these tech companies have the right to do this. 
uh, the right to moderate, the right to regulate in this way. A lot of people over the weekend were making the argument that this was similar from their perspective about forcing, for example, a baker to bake a cake if they didn't believe in gay marriage, that it was a political speech that they would have been forced uh, to do. And so they said this is inconsistent. If you don't believe that the baker uh, should be forced to do it, then you should, uh, you know, it should be, uh, the rules should be applied here uh, consistently because they said it right now it's, it's inconsistent. But let's talk a little bit more about, again, what this means moving forward. The, on eBay, you can see that the, there are iPhones that are being listed for auction with the Parler app already installed. This was app after the Apple uh, market there banned it and said that you couldn't download it from the App Store. And so you saw this over the weekend that people were selling these phones with it pre-installed. But now, even if you go to download it, or even if you do have it installed as I do, it doesn't. It still doesn't work now because Amazon has worked here as well. So, Tom, let's bring you back to the conversation. Tom works. He's a senior advisor with Clout Hub, which is a social media alternative. So, again, looking at this parlor situation, how do you view this from a legal standpoint? Because, for example, Twitter is a publicly traded company, and it has a duty to shareholders. They have fiduciary duty to shareholders to maximize profits. And if you're kicking off hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of users off of your user platform, would that be a breach of a fiduciary responsibility? Well, Kerry, so certainly that's an argument that can be made and probably should be made. But I think the most important thing that the American people really need to step up and speak out on this issue, whether you're a Republican, whether you're conservative, or you're libertarian, whether you're progressive, at the end of the day, big tech and you know some elements of Democrats want to silence free speech. That should frighten every American. And over the weekend, to my surprise, actually, the ACLU was out there actually complaining about, I think, the ban against President Trump on Twitter. And normally, you know, going back, uh, the ACLU used to be very, very strong on free speech. Lately, they have been kind of quiet, seem to be more siding with progressive Democrats, but this is the first time in my recent memory where they're actually come out and really stand up for free speech. And that's what we need. We need groups that are on the far left and the far right and right down the middle to complain to every elected official that free speech is our First Amendment and it must be maintained. And in terms of the, the you mentioned on the left, we looked at uh, John Solomon, our founder, did a piece for Just the News looking at how liberals long embraced the First Amendment before they embraced the censorship in the age of Donald Trump. So the question of what it means to be liberal, this definition seems to have been changed for today's modern liberal. liberal. Justice Thurgood Marshall, who was a liberal justice, he said, if the First Amendment means anything, it means that a state has no business telling a man sitting alone in his house what books he may read or what films he may watch. Our whole constitutional heritage rebels at the thought of giving, it, giving government the power to control men's minds. We also looked, my colleague Susan Katz Keating, at the fact that the 1984 dystopian novel, 1984 by George Orwell, is the top selling book on Amazon. It's available for now. And this was a book that was published more than 70 years ago in 1949. It depicted how government thought police eavesdrops on citizens in their own homes, searching for heresy of any kind. Anyone who, whose beliefs deviate from the official norm are declared, quote, unpersons who never existed. So this idea of thought police and people controlling and telling you what to think, I guess to push back on that, what should, would your be your response to say, well, these are all voluntary platforms. No one's forcing you to download this app. No one's forcing you to log into Twitter. No one's forcing you to even look at Twitter. Well, in the old, and when I think when they first started, I think that was a, a good argument. But right now, uh, these social media platforms are really, they really are the public square. They really are like a utility. It's a way for people to connect with themselves. And these companies, you know, legally, you know, they always say that they're just a platform and they don't do editing. And if you're a platform, we, we can't be regulated. Well, certainly when you're picking winners and losers, you're acting as an editor. And I think that's the area where the most legally vulnerable because A, they're lying. And going back to your point about shareholders, I think shareholders of Twitter and Facebook need really to be concerned about what's going on. Because I'm not sure about your Twitter account, my Twitter account, but 
a lot of people are losing followers and Twitter's claiming that, well, these really weren't real accounts. Well, if they weren't really real accounts, then how are you justifying your user base that you that you communicate that your Twitter is growing? So I think they're really shooting themselves in the foot. They, they don't really have a plan. And I think a lot of shareholders should be upset that Twitter has been misleading the actual number of users on that platform. All of a sudden, politics change and they're getting rid of, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe millions of followers. So I think that's something of a concern that uh, shareholders should be outraged about. Well, there was this concept of shareholder activism that some conservatives really pioneered in the 80s and the 90s. They bought small portions in some cases of publicly traded companies in order to make hell and raise hell with these companies. Do you think we'll see some conservative shareholders doing this, that they might go to a Facebook or a Twitter shareholder meeting and, and say what you just said? <laughs> Carrie, I'm chuckling because I was one of those individuals. <laughs> Once really? upon a time, I, I co I co managed a mutual fund, uh, and it, it, part of the purpose, of, first of all, was to make money. But the second one was to go to shareholder meetings and embarrass CEOs when they did silly things like this, actually stupid things like this, by alienating their own customers. If you're Twitter, you want people from all political sides because you want growth and you want that revenue, that advertising revenue. Well, you know, the American people, even if you're a Twitter user, well, you can start to block their ads. That's the way they're making money, right? You see an ad come down that Twitter timeline feed, block it, and you're starting to shut off Twitter's revenue source. That might wake them up. You could do the same thing, I believe, on Facebook. Just don't click on those ads. That's one way where the millions of people can send a message back to these social media companies. All right, Tom Borelli, thanks so much for your perspective. Thank you. Tom is a senior advisor over there at Cloud Hub, a rising social media platform. Well, stay with us, folks. We've got Tom Bevan. He's the president of Real Clear Politics. You know and love that website. They are an unbiased, just source of left and right altogether. He's going to give us a review of the latest here of the security breach at the Capitol. Stay tuned. Hey there, good morning, good Monday morning, and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield, joined by Tom Bevan. He's the president of Real Clear Politics. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Carrie. So we heard the latest about what happened with the breach, the insurrection on Capitol Hill, that reportedly the Capitol Police, well in advance, had asked for the National Guard to help them with the security here days in advance at least, possibly weeks, where they were still looking or looking at this. And it was reportedly the House and the Senate security officials who hamstrung the efforts to call in the National Guard. Part of it, what they said was they were allegedly concerned about the optics of it. They were concerned about having the National Guard there in front of the U.S. Capitol, the optics of it. What do you know about this in terms of the optics? Why would, why would they put the optics ahead of security? Yeah, I don't know. Look, I think we're going to learn a lot more about this, how this all went down in the coming days and weeks, and it's going to take some time. But obviously, uh, you know, this report, if it's accurate, puts the lie to the idea that somehow this was, uh, you know, that that these folks were uh, treated differently than if they would have been BLM supporters or Antifa, that there would have been a massive security presence. I mean, I, I it looks like it was uh, it was something that was considered. And to your point, um, they did not want to have uh, they put optics ahead of security. And that's that's obviously, um, you know, that's an issue. And it's something that that, again, we're going to figure out more. And, and I think people obviously the cap, you know, Capitol Police chief has already resigned. There'll probably be more resignations coming. Sure. And, and in the case of last summer over by the White House, where I've been often and over the summer, there were times when I felt unsafe because of the crowds. But in the case of, of the very famous instance where the, the, the time when President Trump, he had to go below his into his bunker reportedly. But they brought in the National Guard at that point. Why do you think there was a difference between the National Guard use there versus at the Capitol? Well, I mean, again, look, Democrats have been against using the National Guard, right? Trump has been calling for, to bring in the National Guard here in Chicago, in places like uh, Portland and others. And Democrats and Democratic governors have resisted that consistently all throughout the summer when these riots were going on. So, um, you know, I don't know exactly 
what the circumstances were that led folks at the Capitol to decide that they didn't want to have uh, the National Guard there. Obviously, in retrospect, and in, in hindsight's 2020, they should have been there. It was a big crowd that was in Washington that day. And even though 99% of them weren't involved in the incident, um, there were enough people there that were pushing forward and, and made their way into the Capitol. It was obviously a breach and something, something that shouldn't have happened. So, Tom, your brand, Real Crow Politics, has a really great long track record of bringing thought from the left and the right together in a nonpartisan way as an aggregator. What are you hearing from your readers, your user base about what's happening here? Because you guys have really been at the forefront of moderating, if you will, or just getting the best of and really cutting through the noise about what's there. How do you see the path forward and what are you hearing from your audience? Well, I mean, obviously, the discussion that's going on right now, uh, you know, and this is a what happened last week, obviously, as as with everything these days, is viewed through a partisan lens. So, you know, folks on the left, Democrats, progressives um, are obviously saying, you know, this is an existential threat to our democracy. We have to you know, hold people accountable, not just President Trump, but any of his supporters. We need people expelled from Congress, that sort of thing. And and folks on the right and conservatives, Republicans are saying, and many of them obviously condemned what happened, but at the same time are saying, listen, uh, we're not going to be lectured to by this the sort of anti-American left that spent four months, six months, the last six months, excusing, uh, waving away uh, all of the violence and destruction that happened in American cities across the country. So big political divide. And the question is, how do, how do we move forward as a country? And then how do we move forward politically? How are Democrats going to handle this? Obviously, Nancy Pelosi says they're going to move forward with impeachment. Um, and on the Republican side, you've got you you do have a split, and you've got you know Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley on one side, and folks like Tom Cotton, Tim Scott on the other. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how this all works itself out moving forward. But but obviously, um, you know, it's a partisan issue. You mentioned Pelosi and impeachment. Joe Biden has been silent on this issue of impeachment. Do you think because he wants people to be focused on getting a fresh start to his presidency rather than having all these headlines about the outgoing one? Yeah, Joe Biden's in sort of a similar situation that he found himself in in the summer with the BLM riots and, and that he's going to find himself in more. I think he'd prefer to just move on. I don't think he wants a, to start off his administration with a, a second impeachment and then a trial in the Senate, which would complicate things, obviously make things even more dysfunctional and partisan than they are now. But he's not willing to come out and say that, at least he hasn't been yet, because that would obviously invoke the wrath. Uh, of the folks, particularly members in the House, AOC and others, Nancy Pelosi. I mean, they really want to move forward this with this. They think it's important um, to not only document it as part of the historical record, but to prevent Trump from ever holding office again. And so Joe Biden is once again sort of in a tough situation and his he's doing what he did before, which is at least for the time being to remain silent. So the silence, what does that say about leadership, his leadership? Well, I mean, he's he's not willing or hasn't been willing. Now, eventually he did come out after weeks and weeks of silence. He did come out. He finally reached a point where it was becoming a political issue, uh, a political trouble spot for him, where he did come out and condemn the rioters um, and initially did sort of in sort of soft language and it got tougher. Um, the question is now he's in a different position now. He's won the election. And and is he willing to stand up and and really push back against member, you know, sort of the left wing of his caucus, because again, they're going to be pushing through legislation. His agenda is all getting put on the rails as we speak. And so, you know, I'm not sure what it says about his leadership right now. I think he's just trying to bide his time and wait till he can take office and then he'll move forward and, and try and sort this out. But the Democrats have as many issues internally as the Republicans do right now. You just said a great pun. I'm sorry. I'm a sucker for puns. You, you just said he's Biden his time. Uh, but I want to move to a headline here about you mentioned that uh, President Trump had been urging for the National Guard. Well, he had also well before the Capitol riot, he had also last year advocated for punishment for those who had vandalized monuments. The president and the president's family have said that those who engaged in the riots on Capitol Hill, they should be brought to justice. And under the executive order that the president signed, he said that it's the policy of the United States to prosecute the fullest, to fullest extent permitted under federal law. 
uh, you know, any entity that destroys, damages, vandalizes, or desecrates a mo monument, memorial, or statue within the United States or otherwise vandalizes government property. That was part of the order. So do you think we'll see the president, President Trump, you know, cracking down here in the next 10 days on, on these rioters? Well, I think that process has already moved forward, and he's made his statement. I don't expect Trump to, to really weigh back in on this in any significant way. Um, but we've seen a lot of arrests, and we've seen, you know, the folks putting out, uh, you know, pictures, trying to identify people uh, so that they can continue to hold those who, who did, um, you know, break law and do vandalism and uh, all those things, hold them accountable to the full extent of the law. That's already happening. I think it'll continue. Um, and so whoever whoever was responsible for being inside the Capitol and, and you know, breaking the law will be held responsible. And so but I, I don't expect Trump to necessarily uh, weigh in on that anymore. All right. Tom Bavin, president of Real Clear Politics. We appreciate your time this morning. Thanks, Kerry. And stay with us, folks. We've got more about what's happening on Capitol Hill from Nicholas Balassi, our very own reporter here at Just the News. We'll be right back. Good morning and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield and glad you're here with us. Joining me is Nicholas Balassi. He's senior correspondent here with Just the News. Good morning, Nick. Good morning. So you're our specialist on Capitol Hill. Tell us the latest of what we know. We know that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has said he's she's been pushing Mike Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment. I spoke to a member of Trump's cabinet last week who said there's no way that's happening. They have no plans to do this. So Pelosi has now said that she plans to bring impeachment. How quickly and how likely do you think this will be? I think they're going to try to move it as quickly as possible. That's what I'm hearing from sources on Capitol Hill. And if you listen to uh, House Speaker Pelosi's last press conference, she seems to be ready to fast track this through. There have been different drafts of impeachment articles introduced, but there will be a formal impeachment article a bill, a resolution uh, introduced probably around 11, 11.30 a.m. today. So we'll probably see what the formal impeachment articles look like then and what the draft uh, is when it becomes an actual formal uh, proposal and formal uh, resolution. So we'll see what happens when that gets introduced. As far as the timing of the actual vote, uh, that's still unclear. Uh, Clyburn, the uh, House Majority Whip, was talking about actually following through on impeachment after uh, Joe Biden is in office to let him you know, get settled and start to put some things in place, do some executive orders. Uh, so there, there's some things that are still moving and it's a little unclear about when the vote will happen, but the formal articles will be introduced soon. But Nick, if he's, if, if hypothetically what you just said, if they file impeachment articles after he's left office, what is the point of that? Because he's not going to be president anymore. So there's going to be no penalty because the Senate can't vote to remove him because he's already gone. So why would they do that? And can they even legally do that? It's a good question because it would be an unprecedented move, but uh, there's some talk of the Senate taking some action. It will be a, a Democratic-led Senate, 50-50, with Kamala Harris being the tie-breaking vote uh, once the Georgia senators are sworn in. So there's some talk about possibly barring President Trump from serving in uh, political office in the future, taking some sort of resolution to do that. Uh, again, those are just um, uh, things that are coming out in terms of moves that the Democrats might make. There's been no formal proposal yet on that front. But maybe that's the thinking. If they did it after he leaves office, it could be a move to kind of uh, squash some of his future plans if he has any to run for president again in, in the future. I'm not sure anywhere in the Constitution where it says that you can do that. There will be definitely legal challenges if they go the route of trying to take action after he's out of office. So it's definitely not a sure thing in terms of like what they do 
being concrete. So there will be some challenges, I'm sure. But I think right now it seems like the most likely step that we'll see is the Democrats in the House moving quickly on a vote since they control the chamber on the formal articles of impeachment that they propose later today. That's more the most concrete thing that we know at this time. And, and Nick, you have an article that you wrote and you profiled Illinois Democratic Representative Brad Schneider, where he says the impeachment process, it could take a while to complete. And given that Trump has less than two weeks left in office, Schneider called on Republican leaders in the Senate and House to ask Trump to resign. How likely is this? It seems pretty unlikely. Right. That also seems unlikely. Based on that quote, though, it shows that there are some Democrats, especially some moderate members in the House, who think that this whole process obviously is going to take a long time. So why are why are the House Democrats starting it now when Trump has less than two weeks left in office? You're seeing that, like this quote you just showed, from some Democrats in the caucus who seem a little uneasy about pushing this forward and they see the realities, which is why I think uh, Clyburn made that statement about, okay, well, maybe we'll try something after he's out of office, which like you pointed to is kind of a long shot in terms of the legality and there'll be some challenges and we'll see what they can do with the Senate. They don't even have, they don't have a big majority. I mean, it's 50, 50. And then Harris is the tie breaking vote. You can still get things done when you have the uh, slim majority there, but it's not an overwhelming majority. So there are things that are unclear, but what we know right now is the House will go forward with at least introducing the articles, but you might see some moderates. You might see people like Schneider saying, all right. Well, and what, what about this? Well, Let's talk about uh, Cori Bush. So she's a congresswoman from Missouri. She's a Democrat. She says she wants to expel those who supported the election challenge. I didn't see anywhere in her statement where she acknowledged that Democrats did the exact same thing that her colleagues that she's trying to expel. They voted in 2001, 2005, 2017 to challenge the election results as well. I mean, yeah, I, there's a lot going on in terms of what the other side did when they're complaining. It happens all the time in Washington, you know, like with the debt limit, you know, one side's complaining about the debt limit for a long time, but then when their, their person is in office, their, their party, they just vote to increase the debt limit. We don't even hear about it. That's true. And we all know in politics that hypocrisy is, is the universal sin, that's for sure. Uh, Nick Balsi, thanks so much for joining us. And stay with us, folks. We'll be right back. We're going to talk more about just how close these margins are in Congress. Believe it or not, it's the closest margins in both chambers of Congress in 60 years. That means voters want people to work together. You can see the chart here. We'll put it up or you can look at it online. But the, the American people say that they want left and right to get to work together. We'll be right back. Hey there, good morning and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield and glad you're with us. Well, before the break, I was mentioning a chart that I want to show you guys. It is looking at the percentage of House and Senate seats held by Democrats after each presidential and midterm election. You can see the House there, the blue line, Democrats uh, the uh, it, with the blue line, and then in the Senate, the green line there. You can see that it's, it's just a very narrow differential here. And when we're talking about how polarized the country is right now, I think it's easy to believe that the country is far more divided than it actually is when you actually look at how the voters went into the voting booth and how they made up their mind. You can see that the American people themselves are not represented by the extremes that we see on the left and the extremes that we see on the right. The American people are actually much more in the middle. And what's interesting about this data and this information is that those who are in the middle are going to have a lot more power. This will be, if the rules don't change in the Senate, it will be the centrists that hold the most power. The people who are most willing to listen to someone on the other side are going to be the most powerful people here on Capitol Hill. 
One name, for example, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Now, he's a Democrat, and he says that he does not want to destroy what's known as the filibuster rule, the 60-vote majority. So even though right now it's, it's a 50-50 split on left and right, there's a rule in the Senate that says in order to get past this filibuster majority, you actually need 60 votes in order to proceed on a legislative vote. And the reason why is because the Senate has always been known as to be the cooler, the one that cools uh, to the, the hot uh, house where it's, it's, it's the hot teapot and the Senate is the cooling saucer to that hot teapot in the house to make sure that the most extremes don't just whiplash our country from the left to right so rapidly that, that you just have constant instability and constant gyrations of outcomes. So this is the, uh, the whole point of the Senate is to really lower the temperature because we know over on the House, uh, things can get pretty wild. You have, it's sort of the Wild West over there on the House side. And so the question is whether Democrats will listen to folks like Senator Jim Manchin, or if they're gonna turn to at least the rhetoric by folks like Chuck Schumer. We all know about what Chuck Schumer said during or before the Georgia Senate runoff race, he said that he wants to transform the country, that Georgia, it's all dependent on transforming the country, that if they take over the Senate, he wants to radically transform the country. Now, if you look again, if you see what the American people want, they don't want radical transformation. So the the question of whether the Senate will hold and whether it will keep its majority is really important for the future of our country. And if the Senate is basically turned this into something very similar to the House and the whim of a party can radically change the country, what will people do? I mean, will, will, will the country ever be able to lower the temperature? I'm not sure that that would be helpful at all. So we'll see. And last week I spoke with someone who was very famous with creating what he called triangulation. It was basically bipartisan triangulation by former President Bill Clinton. Now, whatever you think of his personal life, I have lots of thoughts about that. I know a lot of women in this country and a lot of people, a lot of fathers uh, of daughters have a lot of feelings and thoughts uh, about what Bill Clinton did in his personal life. Laying that aside, when you look at what Bill Clinton did on a policy front, the president, uh, Bill Clinton was actually very moderate and on issues like welfare reform, on issues like criminal justice and victims' rights, on issues like balanced budget and fiscal issues. Former President Bill Clinton was very much in the middle. And in fact, he was the guy who moved the Democratic Party much more to the middle. It had gone off the rails and gone so hard left that it was Bill Clinton who really brought it back to the middle. And the way he did this was by this concept called triangulation. And the guy who triangulated for former President Bill Clinton is a guy named Dick Morris. And I spoke to Dick Morris. Funny enough, he's actually a Republican now, but at the time he was a Democrat in the Bill Clinton White House. And leading up to when Dick Morris came into office, he came in or in, into the White House, he came in in 1995. And this was two years after Bill Clinton had just taken office, two years, you know, he took office in 93, but he got his butt whooped, uh, if I can be so crass, in the 94 elections when the Republicans took over under Newt Gingrich. And so in early 95, Bill Clinton, he's, he's, uh, gets walloped. Both houses of Congress get turned over to the Republicans after they'd been in Democratic hands. And Dick Morris said part of why Bill Clinton asked to bring Dick Morrison was because he said, I had gotten so liberal, I didn't even recognize myself. That basically for two years, Bill Clinton had been tugged so hard left because he was trying to appease the far left of his own party that he himself had compromised on his own principles. Now, Dick Morris said that Joe Biden is going to be under even more pressure to go far, far hard left than Bill Clinton was because the average Democrat is the average, uh, you know, 
grassroots leftist Democrat is even further to the left than in 1993. And so Dick Morris said he's not that optimistic that Joe Biden will be able to triangulate the way that Bill Clinton did. We'll see if this is true. But again, the American people voted and they spoke and they said they wanted people to work together. They wanted to see left and right here. Because when you look at the makeup of Congress, again, this is the narrowest, slimmest Democratic majority in 60 years. Uh, this is a time for the country to come together. And on that note, we're going to hear from First Lady Melania Trump a statement that she made on this issue right after the break. Hey there, good morning and welcome back here to Just the News AM. I am Carrie Sheffield. I want to close the show again on this topic of unity and bringing the country together, lowering the temperature. First Lady Melania Trump is out with a new statement. She issued it on the White House website. She says, she goes on, but she says, I implore people to stop the violence, never make assumptions based on the color of a person's skin or use differing political ideologies as a basis for aggression and viciousness. We must listen to one another, focus on what unites us and rise above what divides us. It is inspiring to see that so many have found a passion and enthusiasm in participating in an election, but we, but we must not allow that passion to turn to violence. Our path forward is to come together, find our commonalities, and be the kind and strong people that I know we are. Our country's strength and character have revealed themselves in the communities that have been impacted by natural disasters and throughout this terrible pandemic that has affected all of us. The common thread in all of these challenging situations is Americans' unwavering resolve to help one another. Your compassion has shown the true spirit of our country. Now, the First Lady said that her heart goes out to those who were killed and injured and the subsequent apparent suicide of a Capitol Hill police officer after the siege of the Capitol. She said she sends her condolences and her heart goes to them, as does ours here at Just the News and at Real America's Voice. We are looking forward to brighter days ahead. Stay tuned here at Real America's Voice. War Room is coming up next.